Good evening. It's time to get our service started this evening. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, we'd in, uh, appreciate if you would fill out an attendance card, take one of those from the rack in front of you and fill it out and leave it in the pew. We'll pick it up later. Hope you'll come back and be with us. Some updates on the ones that we announced this morning with health issues. We want to continue to remember uh, Mary Lou LeVan, who fell and broke her pelvic bone uh, this past week. She's still in room 338 at uh, Baptist Health. Roger Jarrett's in Lourdes Hospital, room 416 with pneumonia, but he is improving. Brad Hall will be uh, facing surgery on June the 22nd. Bill Hicks is home from the hospital and feeling better, but still not able to get out. Shelby Collins is in Lakeway, and she'll, she's in room 206, and she'll be there for several more weeks receiving uh, physical therapy. Jenna Pogues in Calvert City Convalescent Center, room 220. Kevin McClard uh, did not have cancer, but he will be having more tests in the near future. Eileen Christ is in Spring Creek Nursing and Rehab Center in Murray. Matt Burkeen is recovering from eye surgery. Uh, some other announcements. Uh, summer Youth Series uh, will be in, at the Central Church of Christ in Paducah this coming Tuesday. Our bus will leave at 6 o'clock. Red Cross will be here on Monday, June the 19th from 12.30 to 5.30 for those who would like to donate blood. And uh, as I mentioned this morning, we have a medical equipment ministry with uh, a few pieces of medical equipment. If you should need that after surgery or after an accident, let me know. We have a, quite a supply that might come in handy for you. I also have a family in need of a bunk bed. This year, instead of Vacation Bible School, uh, there is a trip planned to the Ark Encounter at Williamstown, Kentucky on Saturday, August the 5th. So that everyone is invited to come and go on the trip. The church will be paying the admission costs for all children, but adults will be responsible for their own tickets. A bus will be provided for anyone who needs a ride. More details will be given in the coming weeks. But mark your calendars now for August the 5th if you would like to do that. If you have any questions, ask Luke or Aaron. One final comment I'd like to make is that every week the secretaries prepare what is called an elder's prayer list and puts copies of these on the tables out in the foyer. Now, this is not a list just for the, the elders to use to pray for people. It's for all of us to use. So if you would, pick up a copy of that and take with you and look over it throughout the week. I was counting here. We have a list of 31 individuals, members of our congregation, who are either shut in or unable to come to worship. And... We need to be praying for them. We need to visit them. We need your help in contacting these individuals so that they don't think that we're forgetting them. Thirty-one. Just think about that. 31 individuals. If your name was on that list, wouldn't you enjoy, wouldn't you appreciate having somebody from the church contact you and let you know that they missed you? So please pick up one of these when you leave tonight and use that this coming week. That's all the uh, announcements I have. Jim's going to be leading in our singing. Let's join in. We have one, one late announcements here. And if it's handwritten, I may not be able to. No, here. Oh, it's good. 
There will be a meeting next Sunday, June the 18th for all high school students who would be interested in going on a canoe trip in July, on July the 8th. The meeting will be in the high school classroom between the morning services and Bible class. There will be a one day trip to Buffalo River, Tennessee. If you're interested in chaperoning, please contact Russ Kirby or Tyler Temple. All right. Anybody interested in a canoeing trip? Thank you. Jim. Four hundred and twelve. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me, leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need God. To guide me day and night, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need every hour. Through this land. Travel in the mighty that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy, thine and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take a stand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. I need thy healing every hour. Through this land, setting of the sun. Lead me safely to a land of rest if I a crown of life have won. I have but my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thy healing every hour. Through this pilgrim Yeah. 
396, 396 will be our song before prayer. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls this Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lonely. No, not one, no. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that is No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day. No, not one, no, not one. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, creator of the heavens and earth, it is a gift to be able to humbly approach you in prayer. It's a gift to be able to freely assemble as a church family and to learn from your word. Father, please protect those who protect us. We welcome you in our presence today, Lord. Our intent is to worship you in a manner that's according to your commands and that may be pleasing to you. Lord, increase our faith. May we have the faith that can move mountains. Help strengthen us to take your promises to all the earth. We ask for continued blessings and for your protection on the mission work of the Benton Church, both internationally and here in our community. We praise you for those who have been so generous to provide the financial resources required to do your work. We praise you, Father, in your all-knowing wisdom to establish your earthly church and to provision your church with elders to oversee it. May we allow them to serve with joy and to not become weary. Father, Help to heal and to strengthen our families and our marriages. We thank you for the many children here and for their hearts that so eagerly seek you. We praise you for those who serve and teach our children, helping to bring them up in your ways. We thank you, Father, for providing us such solid preaching through Brother Mark Ray. May the Holy Spirit continue to enlighten him in his studies, the studies of, his, of your word, so that he may continue to deliver to us in profitable ways. We proudly wear the prestigious label of Christians here as members of your church in Benton, Kentucky. Please help us daily to carry ourselves in a manner worthy of the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.
517 will be our song before scripture reading and our lesson 517. Let's be standing for this song and remain standing for the reading to follow. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took out the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now of a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions of mine. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings eternal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my heart was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Song of Encouragement 674. The scripture reading tonight comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whosoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. You may be seated. Good evening. we got a good crowd tonight. Glad that you're here. Glad that we have a good opportunity to study God's Word and to uh, spend time together. One of the things about preaching expositorily, which is a fancy word for saying preaching through the Bible, letting the Bible do your preaching for you, 
is it makes it where you uh, cover every subject under the sun, it seems. I have preached through the book of Matthew, preached through the book of Acts, preached through the book of Revelation and Romans and 1 Corinthians. I guess that means I'm old. But um, done each one, you know, as a year sort of thing. And this year on Sunday nights, we're preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. And so as we go through, we uh, reach this lesson. One of the beauties of preaching in an expository way is it helps you preach the entire counsel of God. Everything that he wants us to know about. Because there's some things which you really get excited about preaching about. And there's some things that you're like, well, I don't know if I really want to do that. Preachers sometimes avoid preaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage because they say it's a moving sermon. Not exactly moving the congregation, but sometimes it moves the preacher. And so sometimes preachers tend to avoid those sort of things because we don't want to get moved in that way at least. But um, as we look at this passage, you see where Jesus is talking about being married and the importance of being married. Now, if you'll remember, two weeks ago, we covered the uh, four verses beforehand talking about lust and the issues that go with lust. But Jesus continues this passage as he talks about what Christian living looks all about, and he covers this area as we go here. And so let's go to our next slide, and we'll see right here what it is that Jesus is talking about. We're going to look at marriage from this aspect, looking at Genesis chapter 2, and also in Matthew chapter 19. And in the next section, we're going to look about four different passages in the Old Testament and New Testament about marriage and the importance of marriage. And then we're going to, in our third part, look at how it applies to each one of us, applicable sort of things for us to take home from tonight's lesson. And so as you and I read this passage, we see looking here in Genesis chapter 2, where God has created all things. And he's created man, and it's interesting that God created man, and he held off before he created woman. And as he sits there and he creates man... He did it for a purpose. It wasn't that he was too busy to get around to doing something. It was to teach a lesson. And he created man and told man to name everything in the garden. So God came along and he named everything as it went along. We don't know exactly which language it was in, but we see that he named it. And as you and I go through looking through the Bible, we see that the idea of a person naming someone else shows authority, shows control, and shows power. But as Adam named everything, he noticed... There's a boy fox and a girl fox. There's a boy hippopotamus and a girl hippopotamus. There's a boy giraffe and a girl giraffe. And he looked around and he saw there is not a girl for him. And so God says this, it is not good for man to be alone. And so God says, I'm going to make a helper for him. I'm going to make somebody just created right for him. And rather than speaking it into existence, rather than creating it from the clay of the ground, such as he did for Adam, he causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep, takes out a rib, and from that rib, he forms woman. And as he forms woman, Adam is awakened, and he is excited. He says, here is flesh of my flesh, here is bone of my bone, she has been created just for me, therefore she shall be called woman. Now, Moses inserts something here as he's going through this passage, and he says the leave, cleave part, part, which oftentimes was what I call it, when a man and a woman are connected, they are to leave their father and mother. And what he is saying here is there is no more important connection, this is taking out the spiritual aspect, no more important fleshly, earthly connection than a man and a woman. It's more than just taking on a person's name. It's more than just sharing a bank account. It's more than just a physical relationship. We see in this passage there's nothing more close in God's eyes than a relationship between a man and a woman. Therefore, Moses would say, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Well, we go from there and we run over to Matthew chapter 19. And as we look at Matthew chapter 19, we see where the Pharisees are always trying to trap Jesus. And so as Jesus has traveled into Galilee, they have a question. It was a raging question of that day, just like it's a raging question that we have today. What do you have to do to get a divorce? And so they come up to Jesus and they say, okay, what do we need? We see the certificate thing going on over in Deuteronomy 24. Jesus, exactly what is needed for a divorce? What do we need to do in order to be able to do that? And Jesus responds and he says, have you not heard... 
from the beginning, God created man and woman. Now, you'll see on the internet, and you'll see a lot of different people say that Jesus never preached against homosexuality. Notice what he says in Matthew 19. From the beginning, God made man and woman. When God discusses marriage, marriage is between a man and a woman. Our government may say something different. Our culture may say something different. But Bible, the scripture, God says that marriage is between a man and a woman. Let me tell you, that feels weird preaching it because it seems like it ought to be common sense. But oftentimes we do have to bring those sort of things up. And so as you and I read through this passage, we see that Jesus says, Have you not heard from the beginning, this is the way it should be. God saw that man needed someone, and he made a helper comparable to him. And he says, Therefore they shall stay together, and let not man separate what God has joined. And you and I read there in verse 9, the only exception for this would be adultery. So as we look at those two passages... Let's go ahead and look at our four P's, our four P's in a pod, if you will. Preachers, they have to use the same letter, but what we do for fun. And let's look at what God has to say in his plan about marriage. First and foremost, marriage, as you and I read this passage, has a purpose. What is the purpose for marriage? Well, obviously, one of the purposes would be procreation. As you and I read in our Bibles, we see that in many ways, God determined that the marriage relationship should have children. And so we go to Genesis 1 and verse 25. And as you and I read in that passage, we see where Adam and Eve were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the entire earth. But that's not the only reason for marriage. As you and I read about marriage, we see not only is procreation one of the purposes of marriage, but a higher purpose, a more important purpose, is the purpose of companionship. God saw it was not good for Adam to be alone. And in that case, he said, I will make someone for him. I will make someone who will help him through life and make things go in a good way. Real quick aside, and we'll talk about this at the end of the lesson. Does that mean you're not as good a Christian if you're single? Does not mean that at all. Read 1 Corinthians 7. Does that mean if you've gone through life for a while and you've waited and you haven't found that that special somebody, that you're uh, faulty in some way? Not at all. 1 Corinthians 7 says the same thing. What if you're a widow and what if your spouse has passed away or what if something has happened to your spouse and he or she is left? That still doesn't make you a second-class citizen. God loves you regardless and you have a huge role in the Lord's church. Read 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so as you and I go through here, we see that marriage has a purpose, procreation, but greater than that, the purpose of companionship. Now, as we go along, we see also that marriage has a pattern. And as you and I read about this idea of pattern, we see that it, God here shows us from Adam and Eve what marriage should look like. And as you and I read this passage, we see Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6. Man and woman are made to be one flesh. Now, oftentimes we will look at that passage and we say that is the physical relationship that a man and a woman have, as far as the physical side. And in many ways, that is true. But it's deeper than that. God created husbands and wives to share life together, to enjoy life together, to encourage one another to grow closer to God. Read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. And so if you are married, if you have a spouse, realize one of your main jobs... One of, the one, thing, one of the things that God has put you on this earth for is to encourage your spouse to get to heaven. And as you and I encourage spouses, encourage people to get to heaven, guess what? It helps us to get to heaven as well. Now, so often we get busy in life. So often there are things which bother us in life, and we tend to become selfish in one matter or the other. God reminds us here the pattern of marriage is for us to be one flesh and to help our spouse get to heaven. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, you see here the idea of the pattern. And what you see here as you look, look at this passage is God is working through Paul to write this. And he says, listen, this is how important marriage is. Marriage is an illustration of the church. Just as Christ loves the church, will surrender his life for the church, 
will do everything in the world that he can for the church, so also husbands have to have a level of sacrificial leadership for their wives. Looking at wives, he says, wives need to respect their husbands. They need to submit to their husbands. They need to love their husbands. Not found there, but found over in Colossians. They need to love their husbands. Because that's the illustration of the submission and the love and the support that Christ gives to the church. You see that pattern which goes there. And so every person who is married is living an illustration of God's love for his church. And every person who is married is living an illustration of the church's commitment to Christ. And so marriage is more than just a husband and a wife dealing with one another. You know, they're going to go eat one day. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't care. Going back and forth. Marriage is more than that. Marriage is dealing with people at their worst. Marriage is dealing with people when they're aggravating. Marriage is dealing with people when they don't deserve love because it's a pattern of Christ and his church. It's a pattern of God's creation. Our third P that we look at is the idea of permanence. One thing you and I learn about the world, nothing lasts forever, right? Nothing lasts forever. The other day I was cleaning out around the house and I ran across a lot of Christmas gifts that me and the boys were excited about getting in December, and they haven't been touched in a few months. And man, I wanted some of that stuff that I got. And I played with it for a while. I don't want it anymore. It crossed my mind. I thought, I wonder if I could wrap it again and if anybody would notice when Christmas comes. Then I thought, maybe I could send it back, get some money for it, and then buy whatever next year. Have you noticed nothing lasts? Cars, they wear out. Houses, they wear out. People, yikes, sometimes we wear out, don't we? And as you and I look around the world, we see that in many ways, marriage is disposable as well. And all of us know a lot of folks who, you know, their marriages didn't turn out. They didn't work out the way that we wanted them to work out. And Jesus here in this passage, both in Genesis 2 and Matthew 19, talks about the permanence of marriage. Now, a lot of times we'll quibble and say, okay, this is exactly what this says and that says, looking at doctrine in many ways. But notice what Jesus is after in this passage. Jesus tells us that there is one reason for a marriage to end. Now that's different than what the Jews were looking for. Because the Jews like this idea of, hey, if my wife does not look the way that she, I want her to look, I'll go find me a new one. Or if my wife doesn't cook the way that she, I want her to cook, I'll get me a new one. Or if my wife is old and, you know, I don't, or old fashioned or just been around a while, I'll go get a new one. And we live in a culture that's very disposable as far as the way it treats folks. And what Jesus is saying here is no, because you are with this person in a purpose, because you're following the pattern, we need to have a permanence to marriage. Now, listen to me real quick. Our love and our commitment to God is not shown as much when we're newlyweds and marriage is easy. A lot of times our love and commitment to God is shown when marriage is hard, when forgiveness is required, when things get difficult. Because that's when we really actually begin to look more like Jesus. That's when we really actually begin to... uh, to show the love that God has for us. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That even when we don't deserve love, we still receive grace and we still receive mercy. Lastly, as you and I look at this, we see that marriage is absolutely precious. Jesus emphasized the sanctity of marriage. It is precious stuff. Notice what we see here when we look at Matthew 19. Because the apostles, when they heard Jesus, they're like a lot of people today. You have got to be kidding. And they go up to Jesus and they say, this is a hard teaching. Maybe we need to massage this a little bit and work with this a little bit more, Jesus. Maybe, you know, you said this and you didn't exactly mean it. Can't imagine apostles saying that. But boy, a lot of people say that about scripture today, don't they? And so they come back to Jesus there in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 10. 
And they say, you know, Jesus, if that's serious, we'd better stay single because it would be better not to marry because your laws are awfully tough. Your laws are awfully difficult. And Jesus responds with a very unique statement. He said there's a lot of people who have to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. A lot of people will have to sacrifice a lot of things because of this doctrine which is here. But Jesus didn't loosen it up. Jesus didn't dilute it. He kept it there. Now, why would that be? Because Jesus saw that marriage is a very precious thing in his sight. And he saw the importance of marriage in every aspect. And so, looking at our four Ps going along here. And you got to say four Ps. When I first began preaching, I looked up and I said, if you'll notice on the board, I've got two P. And nobody heard anything else in the entire sermon. So now I don't do two P. We got four P's. So what are our four P's? Marriage has a purpose. Companionship. You're made to be one flesh. Marriage is a pattern. We follow Adam and Eve. People who are made for one another. People who support one another. People who help one another. You see the permanence there. When you get hitched, you're there. Right? We are to be attached very strongly. And you see it's precious. It is sanctified in the eyes of God. But people don't always follow this pattern. And so let's look at the teaching going throughout Scripture of what Paul and others would say. Let's go ahead and go to our next slide there. As you and I go through this passage, we see uh, we're just going to look at three. Uh, There's actually about 12, but I I preach late today and I really want to go home. I'm tired. So I'm playing with you. I'm not tired. I can preach all day. All right. But I won't. Don't worry. We're just going to look at three. Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. Go ahead and turn in your Bible over to Malachi chapter 2. And let's see what the writer of Malachi says here. Now, let's do some context and background. Because a lot of times we'll read a verse and we don't really see what's going on. And sometimes that hurts our exegesis or our interpretation of the passage. Other times, while it doesn't hurt our interpretation of the passage, it brings it out a little bit more clearly what it is that the prophet is talking about. Remember, uh, a lot of these people were co-current. In other words, when Malachi happens, he is living at the same time. He is friends and companions with other people. And so Malachi, this passage talking about marriage, he lived at the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah. And so as you read this passage, remember back in Ezra chapter nine and verses, uh, chapters 9 and chapters 10. Ezra has brought the people back along with Nehemiah, and they've rebuilt the walls. And so now the temple's rebuilt. Now, Well, the temple will be rebuilt a little later. But now the walls are rebuilt. The, the uh, people are now able to defend themselves and are able to actually be a country. You can't have a country without secure borders. And so Ezra and Nehemiah have worked together to get that. Well, once the borders are secured, they begin looking at the people and realizing, we've got a lot more to build than just walls. We've got to build people. Because there happened to be a habit among the folks. Now that all the Gentiles had been pushed out of the city, all of the leading rulers, all the leading men were gone. Sanballat and others were pushed out. Where their daughters and their wives oftentimes would be left behind. And many of these Jewish ruling elite would look around and say, Well, hey, here's this lady, doesn't have anybody to take care of her. She's pretty good looking. A little bit younger, a little bit better looking than the one I'm with. And so they would get rid of their wives and they were picking up these new wives. Ezra and Nehemiah had a major issue with this because it showed that they did not believe in the sanctity and the importance of marriage. And so as you and I read through here, we see a great illustration. It just sticks in my mind quite a bit. It's over in Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 25. Ezra gets so angry about this. Ezra was uh, pretty much of a zealot. And he was one of those guys that just really got after whatever it was he really got after. Well, we see in Nehemiah 13, 25, where he goes and he is so angry, he grabs these people by the hair and begins dragging them around and saying, you're not following God very well at all. I'm glad that's in the Old Testament because that's not something I want us to do in the church today, right? When you get few hairs... You begin to really protect them, right? Don't want anybody grabbing your hair and pulling you around by it. But we see there where the issue was. Many of these Jewish ruling elites were beginning to find people that they could take advantage of. And soon as they had used these people, 
they would just throw them out and they would find somebody new to take advantage of once again. Well, that's the background that Malachi is. And so let's go ahead and read Malachi chapter 2. And let's start in verse 10, if you will. Have we not all one father? This is New King James, by the way. Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? That word treacherously. Real quick as we're going. If you have an English standard, it's going to say faithlessly. And it's talking about the attitude going on in their marriages. And so if you're an underlying kind of fella, underlying treacherous or faithlessness, if you're not an underlying kind of fella, just let it ring every time we read it. Okay? Because that's our key word as we run through here. All right? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being aware and awake. Yet he who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. The second thing you do, you cover the altar with tears, weeping and crying, and we see uh, weeping and crying, does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. And you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt, look at that word, treacherously. Yet she has been your companion, companion and your wife by covenant. But, he did not, did, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none of you deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. It covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal, look at that word, treacherously. All right, you notice I'm trying to emphasize that word coming through all of these, this passage. I think it's there five times if I've, if I've read it right in the correct way. Now, what is it that Malachi is saying? Malachi is saying when you have a wife of your youth and they get older or they get inconvenient or they just get aggravating, he says when you get rid of that wife and go find a younger one or go find a better one or go find a prettier one, you have broken the covenant because you have been treacherous. In other words, what he's saying is it's very difficult to go through a divorce and live the right way without sin. And oftentimes when a divorce happens, at least one side has been treacherous towards the other one. At least one side has been faithless towards the covenant towards the other person. Now, there are a lot of people who remain married who are treacherous one to another. And there's a lot of people who are in a marriage where the husband or the wife is faithless. I'm not talking about committing adultery. But I'm talking about there being a lack of respect. Talking about there being an aspect of where one spouse or the other just grows in hatred and just grows in anger and just turns against his spouse or her spouse and begins to not live the way God would have them to live. And what Malachi says is when we do such things, we break our covenant with God. Because we made a promise when you're in front of the church building or wherever it was, and you took those marriage vows, you took those marriage vows before God. When you did it in front of people, you made that marriage vow in front of people. And when you made that marriage vow, you made it in front of your spouse. And so what Malachi is saying is you need to stay with the wife of your youth and be faithful towards them. Now, when we're in the church building... That is really, really easy to say. But when your spouse snores, it gets a little harder, doesn't it? And when your spouse acts in a really weird way, that gets a little harder, doesn't it? And when your spouse gets on your nerves, that gets a little harder, doesn't it? But regardless, Malachi says, don't be treacherous towards your spouse. Remain in the covenant. Remain faithful to them. All right, we go a little bit later. Uh, let's go to the New Testament. Do the New Testament for a little bit. Matthew chapter 19, 3 through 10 tends to be the uh, classic place where we like to go. And as you and I go over to Matthew 19, we see it's where the uh, Pharisees are really trying to catch Jesus with an unpopular teaching of the day. And as they go to him, 
they ask him, you know, what can we get divorced for? And he says, well, you know, adultery, and that's about it. And they say, well, the Old Testament says something here. And so they have an Old Testament discussion and about talking about the hardness of hearts, going back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. But as you and I look through this passage, what Jesus is talking about here is the idea of faithfulness to your spouse. Notice what he says, what God has joined together. That's verse 6, by the way. What God joins together, don't get in the business of separating it. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, of course, there are times when there's exceptions to that. Going back to Deuteronomy 24. Matthew 5 and what's possibly an interpolation. Matthew 19, which is in the original text, reminds us that the only reason which God has given for divorce would be adultery. Now, something I covered two weeks ago, maybe I didn't cover it well enough. What is adultery? It comes from the Greek word porneia. Sometimes we think, well, hey, porneia, pornography, that's where that word comes from. It's the exact same thing. You read the Greek scholars, people who have made their living and made their life and studying it, it is the actual physical union with another person is what's meant here by the word adultery in Matthew chapter 19. And so when that occurs, then it is possible for that covenant to be broken. It's not required And sometimes it's not even God's will, but it is possible when we see the case of adultery, which is there, an idea of fornication. Well, what is it that we're talking about when we go a few verses earlier there in Matthew 5, once again looking at what we looked at two weeks ago, where he says, He who looks upon a woman begins to lust after her, and he has already committed adultery. Well, is that the exact same thing that we're talking about here in Matthew 19? Well, not really. It's a figure of speech. Uh, We read over in 1 John, and I just do this for illustration, and I'll move through it pretty quick so I can finish everything. 1 John 3, 15. He who is a liar is a murderer. Okay? What is John talking about in that passage? A person who lies is his father is the devil, right? John 8. But he's saying that lying is going to lead to that murder. Spiritual murder, physical murder, which is there. Very few people in the Lord's church today would say, well, okay, you know, if somebody lies, they're guilty of murder. They need to go to jail. That, that's not what that passage is talking about. What that passage is talking about is it's going to lead to that point. And that's what you see there in Matthew chapter 5 as well. That's just a quick aside that you see there. Now, as we continue rolling along, let's look over in 1 Corinthians 7. And 1 Corinthians 7 is a fun passage. At one time, 20 years ago, I could quote this passage, and I could quote half of it in Greek. Um, The reason for that was my uh, thesis, and it turned out to be an individual study in college, was on 1 Corinthians 7, and the the appalling privilege, uh, so-called appalling privilege, and the view of it of people in southeast Texas. Now, if that sounds boring, guess what? It was boring. I had to write a 140-page paper with like 100 sources. It took off many years of my life, made me miserable for a long time. But that's how those things go. But it's one of those things where 1 Corinthians 7 is a very fascinating passage as you go through it. Some people say 1 Corinthians 7 replaces Matthew 19. I don't agree with that aspect. And we can spend a lot of time talking about it because that's more than a sermon. That may be a whole quarter of Bible classes. Notice what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, Jesus had the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, right? And then he more fully explains what Jesus was doing when you go over to 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way, Jesus describes the law in Matthew 19, and Paul more fully describes it when you get over to 1 Corinthians 7. But for the parameters of this lesson tonight, I want us to notice what verses 10 and 11 say. And so as we look over here in 1 Corinthians 7, and look at verses 10 and 11, we see where Paul is really pressing about the idea of marriage. And he says, notice this, this is the overriding principle that he's trying to get across. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband should not divorce his wife. What you see in this passage, and there's 
there is an interpolation, or there is a progression, if you will, as you go across. You see in 1 Corinthians 7 that wives and husbands should not physically not be together. That's not God's plan. And as he goes through, he says, recognize and realize if your spouse is not a Christian, and your spouse says it's either me or God, he says you choose God every single time. Your relationship with God is more important than your relationship with your children, with your spouse, with your employer, or anybody else. Your relationship with God is first, foremost, and primary. But he says when they depart, you remain unmarried or you be reconciled. Do not divorce as long as you can, in the best way that you can, stay committed to your spouse. All right, our last slide. And that's exciting right there, isn't it? Just to say it's the last slide. Let's talk about application. God is redemptive. Here are some things I want us to take home from this. To the divorced, here's the lesson. God has not given up on you. There is life after divorce. Now, sometimes in the church, you may not feel like it. You may feel, man, this is over. I cannot show my face in church. I cannot serve in church. I don't matter anymore. That's not true. God is redemptive, and he will work through your life regardless of what your past has been. And so whatever state you're found, whatever state you're called, God will work with you. Every single one of us oftentimes do not live up to the ideals of God. We make mistakes, we make shortcomings, we, make, uh, we don't live up to what we want to live up to, and sometimes our life doesn't go the way we want it to go. But realize that God loves you, and he'll work through it. Romans eight twenty eight: all things work for the glory of God, and all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. Now, sometimes that road can get winding, Sometimes that road can turn one way or the other, but God is there. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 tells us to cast our anxieties upon the Lord because the Lord cares for you. Put God first and recognize this church and the Lord's church is created for you. Be faithful unto God. To children, to relatives, to family of those who are divorced... Recognize God can redeem you too. You are not defined by the relationship of someone else. You're defined by your relationship that you have personally with God. You're not second-class citizens. God works in your relationship. Now, thirdly, to the married, to those who are still married, and even if you're struggling, even if you're struggling in your marriage and nobody knows about it, look at your life. Guard your spirit. It is very difficult to be right with God when you're not right with the spouse. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Your prayers can be hindered. Your influence can be hindered. And your faithfulness can be hindered. Wherever you are in your marriage, whether you are super happy or whether you're just thinking, wow, what in the world did I end up with? Guard your spirit. Guard the things that you say. Guard the ways that you act. And watch the attitude that you have with your spouse. Going back to the book of Malachi. Don't be faithless. Don't be treacherous in the way that you treat your spouse. Put them first and foremost in everything that you do. As we close, we'll run over to Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 33. And as we look at that passage... Notice what he commands husbands and wives to do. Husbands, love your wives. Going into a little bit of counseling here, wives need to be loved. They need to be cherished. They need to be treasured. Every opportunity you have, show love to your spouse. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't even have to be public. But don't speak ill of your spouse and show love at every opportunity that you have. A little bit later in Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, it says, wives, respect your husbands. Now, after centuries of counseling and centuries of scientific research, people have come to agree with the Bible. Husbands love 
to be respected. They love someone who looks up to them, love someone who just really thinks that they are doing well. So wives, respect your husbands. Appreciate the good work that they do. Appreciate the life that they live. Appreciate the work that they're trying to do. Now, are they always perfect? No, because not a single one of us are perfect. We are frail, we are short, we are sinful. But God's grace is shown through these jars of clay that are cracked and that are old and that are wearing out. And when we, through our failures of our life, show God's love and show God's faithfulness, then we bring to God glory which is there. All right, let's close with a prayer and then we'll be done. Pray with me if you will. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this church and this congregation and all that she stands for. I thank you for every single person who is here tonight and even those who weren't able to make it out. Father, this night we pray that you be with our marriages. We pray that you be with those who have just married, who are starting out life. We pray that you be with those who have just had babies, whose life is suddenly now very changed. We pray that you'll be with them, that you'll bless them in the marriages which they have. Father, I pray that you be with those who have marriages tonight that are struggling and not doing well. Father, we pray for your forgiveness. We pray for your strength. We pray for your wisdom in dealing with such things. Father, help each person to remain faithful in their marriage and faithful to their vows. Help each person to see that they are a reflection of you. And help each person to see that they can show grace and mercy even when it's not deserved. Father, I pray that you be with all those of our congregation who are widows and widowers. We thank you for the legacy in which they've lived in their marriages. We're thankful for the example that they give to us even today. And we pray that you be with them in their loneliness. And we pray that you be with them as they remember the wonderful times that they've had with the spouse. Father, I pray that you be with those who are divorced. We pray that you will give them a measure of wisdom and a measure of faithfulness as well. Father, I pray that you will help them to live life the way that they should, to give them strength through temptations and strength through troubles. Father, in all things, we praise you. We know that you're the great I am. We know that you're in control of all things. And we know that each one of us needs to remain faithful to you and put you first in our life. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for your mercy. We're so thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your love, even when we don't deserve it. We pray that you may shape us and mold us and guide us to be what we should be each and every day. Father, in all things, we love you. In the name of your Son that we pray, and amen. Now, at the end of every lesson, we have an invitation. And so before you get out and go out this week, let's be sure before we leave this building that we're all right with God. How do you make sure that you're right with God? You follow the commands of the Bible. We read in the Bible that we have to believe in Him, that we have to repent or change from a worldly lifestyle to a godly lifestyle, that we need to be willing to confess the name of Jesus Christ, and that if we are to be members of the church, we must be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you have not yet obeyed the gospel, don't leave this building tonight in a lost state, but make a commitment to know the Lord and His love for you. Tonight, if you need the prayers of the church, it would be an honor for every one of us to pray with you and help you because we're all on a journey to heaven together. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel and become a Christian or if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
taken of the Lord's Supper today, then this is your opportunity to do so now. If you'll follow <clears throat> someone back to the library, you will be served communion. Our closing song will be number <clears throat> 652. 652, we'll sing the first and last verses, then we'll be led in our closing prayer. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's day which you've given us. It's time, Father, that we've had to come and praise you and worship you. Father, be with us as we leave and we go to our homes and we prepare to go to our workplaces this week. Help us to remember what we've learned and take it with us and live it every day. Father, we pray for the leaders of this church, our elders, our deacons, our song leaders, our preachers, Father, be with them and be with us all in our walk with you. Father, we're thankful for this youth group that we have here at Benton. We, we pray for the leaders, Father, that are searching for our new youth minister. Father, we ask you please be with them. And Father, help us to find us the right one that fits our group and fits this what we need here at, at Benton. Father, be with our missionaries across the way. Bless them and keep them and comfort them, Father, and help guide them, Father. Father, we ask you please forgive us of our sins. Be with us through the rest of this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.